Matthew Henry, the well-known Puritan devotional writer, once wrote these words. He said, be not afraid of saying too much of the praises of God. All the danger is of saying too little. He was absolutely right. We're all in danger of not praising and not thanking our God enough for his many blessings, for his many benefits in our lives. And even though last Thursday we all celebrated Thanksgiving Day, and we were probably a little more conscious, a little more aware of our need to give thanks to the Lord, we all tend to fall short of expressing our gratitude to him on a daily, regular basis. And so this morning, in light of it being the first Sunday after Thanksgiving Day, I want us to study a psalm that reminds us not only of the importance of praising God by thanking him, but actually tells us what we should be thanking him for. The psalm I'm referring to is Psalm 103, which I just read to you a few minutes ago. Though written by David, King David over 3,000 years ago, this psalm remains totally applicable, totally relevant for us today, because unlike many of the other psalms which David penned, which refer to events that took place in his day and related to the nation of Israel, Psalm 103 isn't like that. It is a psalm of pure, undiluted praise to God and nothing else. There are no prayer requests in Psalm 103. There are no complaints in this psalm. There are no words about the psalmist's fears or his worries or his feelings of despair. There are no outbursts of anger against the Lord's enemies in this psalm. There are no calls for judgment upon sinners No moments of sadness, no lamenting over not being in the land of Israel or in Jerusalem at the temple. And there are no struggles over personal guilt. There are no cries of repentance that you find in in this psalm. Instead, Psalm 103 is simply a song of praise offered to the Lord for his benefits and his blessings in the life of a child of God and a concern that God as sovereign ruler of the universe would be worshiped by his creation. One Bible teacher described this psalm as, and I quote, the authentic utterance of a redeemed child of God who piles up words to express his gratitude to the God of grace. And that's exactly what this is. And unlike some psalms where we we really don't know who the author is, as I said a moment ago, we do know that the redeemed child of God who piles up these words of gratitude here in Psalm 103 is none other than David, king of Israel. Because the heading above the psalm identifies David that he's the author. In fact, it has been called David's hallelujah chorus because there's nothing quite like the praise that David utters in this psalm found in any other psalm that he wrote. In fact, so impressive is the praise to God that ushers forth from David's lips that Charles Spurgeon offered these towering words of praise for this psalm of praise. Spurgeon said this, and there's nobody who wrote, nobody who communicated like Spurgeon. Here's what he said. As in the lofty Alps, some peaks rise above all others, so Among even the inspired psalms, there are heights of song which overtop the rest. This 103rd psalm has ever seemed to us to be the Mount Rosa, which is a huge ice-covered mountain in the Swiss Alps, of the divine chain of mountains of praise glowing with with a rosier light than any of the rest. It is the apple tree among the trees of the world and its golden fruit has a flavor such as no fruit ever bears unless it has been ripened in the full sunshine of mercy. David awakens all the melodies of heaven and earth in honor of the one only living and true God. And then Spurgeon, interestingly enough, adds these fascinating words about his own inadequate attempt to teach, to exposit, to to explain and unfold this psalm. He said, our attempts at exposition is 
commenced under an impressive sense of the utter impossibility of doing justice to so blime a composition. We call upon our soul and all that is within us to aid in the pleasurable task, but alas, our soul is finite and our mental faculty far too little for the enterprise. There's too much in the psalm for a thousand pens to write. It's one of those all comprehending scriptures, which is a Bible in itself, and it might alone almost suffice for the hymn book of the church. Now, folks, these are remarkable words from a man. I'm referring to Charles Spurgeon now, a man who taught on every psalm in the Bible, and he filled volumes with his sermons on the Psalms called the Treasury of David. That's what Spurgeon said. Of, of all the Psalms, this stood out as the most impressive one to him. So what is it that makes Psalm 103 so special? Well, it's not simply that David offers praise to God that makes the Psalm, the psalm stand out, because frankly, there are many Psalms that speak of praising God. It's not that. What makes Psalm 103 so unusual, so special, so significant, so, so really standing out in our minds and something that all of us can relate to is that David, note this, David has to stir himself up to praise God because praising God did not come easy to him. It did not come naturally to him. He had to force himself to do this. He had to work hard at it. Notice how he begins the psalm in verses 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Now notice, notice what David is doing here. He is talking to himself. He's not talking to the Lord. He's telling his own soul, probably because it was a little sluggish, to get going, to start praising the Lord. In other words, he has to rouse himself to worship God by calling upon his soul to remember the Lord's blessings in his life. One gets the impression that David had to speak to himself like this because he had trouble praising God. He had to remind himself to do this since it was so easy for him to forget all that God had done for him and to be so very thankful for all of those blessings. Folks, that's what makes this psalm so special so unique and so applicable and so, frankly, so appealing to us because all of us can relate to having difficulty when it comes to, to praising God, all of us. We know we should praise him more than we do, but so often it comes down to the fact that we just don't feel like praising him. In our struggles with the challenges of life, there are times when we feel so low that the last thing we want to do is praise God and sing songs to him, especially when we come to church. It's during those low times when our thoughts turn to our troubles and trials and problems that we can easily forget how good God has been to us, how much he's blessed us, all the benefits that he's given us by his grace. And then there are other times in life when things are going so well for us, everything is in the flow and we're feeling good, that it's just also easy to forget that these good things come from our gracious God, and these are blessings for us. But we tend to forget to praise him even as we enjoy these blessings. So this is a psalm that we all can identify with because it was written by someone who's just like us, someone who didn't find it easy, who didn't find it natural to praise God, but he did it anyway. He didn't have to get emotionally hyped up to do it, he did it anyway. And that's why this psalm is so valuable to us because not only does David instruct us on the importance of praising and thanking God even when we don't feel like it, but in this psalm he tells us how we should praise God and why we should praise God. Although in this psalm, yes, it's true that David does speak as we read further, he speaks of the nation of Israel praising God. He speaks of creation, the angels praising God. My intention this morning is for us to study this psalm and only today, only this morning, and only the first five verses of the psalm. There's not going to be a series on this. And I want us to see from these first five verses the way David personally stirs his own soul to praise God and some of the reasons that he lists 
for praising him. So, as I said, focusing on only the first five verses of Psalm 103, the first thing we see as David begins, we see David stirring his own heart to praise God. Again, verse one. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, David starts this psalm by speaking, but he's not speaking to God. He's speaking to himself. Notice he calls upon his soul. What what does he mean by his soul? He means his whole being and all that is within him. He means the very depth of his innermost being. He calls upon his soul from the very depth to bless God's holy name. Now, there's so much in this statement that it would be wrong It would be wrong of me to just superficially comment on it and move on. We need to stay here a while. We need to consider all that David is telling us because what he's telling us are some very vital truths that help us to learn how to praise and thank God. First of all, he's telling us from his own personal experience. That's important that you see that. He's telling us from his own personal experience That there are times when we need to, just as he did, we need to stir our hearts to praise God. There are times when we need to just talk to ourselves and to rouse ourselves to action. So that whether we feel like it or not, we need to start expressing gratitude and praise to God. And it's critical that we learn to do this because there are times in our lives frankly, when praising God is the last thing that we feel like doing. And unless we know that we have to get tough on ourselves and have to start ordering our souls to praise God, even commanding our souls to do it, we're just not going to do it. You see, if, if we think that the only times we should praise God is when we feel like praising Him, when we're up emotionally, then the reality is you're not going to do much praising. Those times are few and far between. Now, David doesn't tell us why he had to stir his soul to praise God. Perhaps he was facing some personal discouragement in his life. Maybe he was down and depressed over something going on, either personally or with his leadership of Israel. But implied in his self-exhortation is that praising God wasn't something that, that he found easy to do at that time. However, instead of giving in to his feelings, instead of focusing on himself and his problems, David starts ordering himself to focus on God by offering him praise and thanksgiving. And that's exactly what we have to do when we're going through hard times. We need to start ordering ourselves to praise God the way he should be praised. Listen, if we're honest with ourselves, We have to admit that sometimes we just don't feel like praising God, not even in church. We often come to church loaded down with discouragements, and yes, we may go through the motions of singing the songs of praise that appear on the screen, but our hearts aren't necessarily in it. And that's when you have to grab yourself by the collar, and you have to say to yourself words to this effect, listen to me, soul, you will bless the Lord. I'm telling you, you will bless the Lord and you'll do it right now, regardless of how you feel, regardless of how many problems you have. You will praise the Lord and you'll start doing it now. We read something very similar to this in Psalm 42, when the psalmist, and we don't know the author of that psalm, but the psalmist tells us that while in a state of depression, because he was unable to be in the temple In Jerusalem, he had to start preaching the truth to himself. And here's what he says in verse 5. Why are you in despair, O my soul? Notice he's talking to his soul, just like David. He's not talking to the Lord. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. Now this man had to tell himself the truth. And the truth is there's no reason to be in despair because God hadn't left him. God was there for him, God would deliver him, and he would again praise God for delivering him. In other words, he had to remind himself that he could trust God regardless of his circumstances, regardless of how down he felt emotionally. 
And David is doing exactly the same thing here in Psalm 103. He's preaching to himself. He's telling his soul that regardless of what I'm personally going through, there's no reason to refrain from praising God. So get on with it. Start blessing the Lord. That's David's attitude. Folks, this is where praise begins. It is a spiritual discipline that we sometimes have to force ourselves to do by talking some sense to ourselves. But in addition, in looking at the opening statement of this psalm, we gain some important insight as to what David means when he tells his soul to praise God. I want you to notice that David doesn't actually use the word praise in this psalm. The word praise in Hebrew, in essence, means to boast about someone or something. But David doesn't say that. Instead, he uses another Hebrew word that's translated bless. And he mentions it several times. Verse 1, verse 2, verse 20, verse 21, verse 22. So what does the word bless mean? What does it mean to bless someone? Well, this particular Hebrew word conveys the thought of bestowing a blessing on someone. It's not particularly deep. It just means bestowing a blessing on someone in the sense of giving or transmitting something to them. The word is most often used in scripture of God conveying a blessing upon his people. But that's not how it's being used here in Psalm 103. See, here David orders his soul to bless the Lord rather than asking the Lord to bless his soul. So how does that work? What can we possibly bestow or give to God since he has everything and he needs nothing? Listen carefully. What we can offer to God, what he wants from us, what delights him, what pleases him is to hear from his people words of gratitude, appreciation, adoration, and praise. This is what we offer him in our worship, in our adoration. Hebrews 13, 15 says, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. Ephesians 5.20, Paul says, always, always, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. When you stop and think about this, it is actually an astounding truth that this majestic, transcendent, everlasting God, our creator, our sustainer, our Lord, our savior, our master, that he actually delights in the praises of his people. In fact, the Bible teaches that God created us so that we would praise him. Isaiah 43, verse 21, the people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. God formed us for himself to declare his praise. And we're the only ones doing it. Nobody else is doing it. 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The reason the church has been formed and exists is to praise and thank God. So at this point, Based on the first verse of the psalm, what do we know so far about praising and thanking God? Well, we know that sometimes we have to stir ourselves up to praise him by talking to our souls, and meaning business. We also know that praising God means offering up thanks and expressions of appreciation to him. But there's something else that David tells us about praising God from this opening line in his psalm. Notice he exhorts not only his soul to bless God, but he wants all that is within him, he says, to bless the Lord. So what does that mean? <coughs> well, what he means by this is that he wants his praise to come from his heart, from his mind, from his affections. He doesn't want his praise to be superficial, to be surfacy, to be external only. He wants his praise to be with everything he's got within him. He, he wants to put his whole heart into it, not, not simply offer God empty lip service that's void of any affection for him. 
Listen, Jesus condemned the Jewish leaders of his day for worshiping God with mere words and not heartfelt love. The Lord said in Matthew 15, 8, he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. On another occasion, our Lord also warned us, his own people, about praying with vain repetition, which is praying without thinking about what we're actually saying, just repeating words without engaging our minds. We often criticize the Roman Catholic Church for their vain repetition, and rightly so, but we can be guilty of that as well. We can easily do this. We do it by singing words of a song without even thinking about what these words mean that we're singing. We're just so used to them. We're so familiar with them. And we're, we're entering now into a season of the year where we'll be singing a lot of Christmas songs. And we've done this year after year. You can easily sing these songs without engaging your mind, just going through the motions. It's mindless, it's thoughtless, it's careless, and it dishonors the Lord. It's just mechanical, that's all. So how do we guard our hearts from praise that is mechanical, praise that is meaningless, vain repetition? Well, as David continues, he tells us how in verse two. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Now David repeats for emphasis what he's just said in the first verse by telling himself again to bless the Lord. But notice that he adds something now that he didn't say in verse one. Now he tells himself that in addition to stirring his soul to bless the Lord, he also needs to say to his soul, forget none of God's benefits. Engage your mind in thinking about how God has benefited you. Listen closely, because what David is telling us here is the reason that we should be constantly praising and thanking God. It's because God has been so good to us. He's blessed us so greatly. He's given us benefit after benefit. And the cause of our negligence to bless God is often because we are so prone to forget those blessings and benefits that come from the hand of our gracious God. Listen, our memories are strange things, are they not? Because while we have trouble remembering how good God has been to us, we usually have no trouble remembering the bad things that have happened to us especially the bad things that other people have done to us. Concerning the problem with our memories, once again we turn to Spurgeon, who said this, as only he could. Memory is very treacherous about the best things. By a strange perversity, engendered by the fall, it treasures up the rubbish of the past and permits priceless treasures to lie neglected. It is tenacious of grievances and holds benefits all too loosely. Now, because Spurgeon is Spurgeon, and you may go, what? What does that mean? Let me interpret it for you. He's saying that the fall, meaning the fall of, of mankind in the Garden of Eden, has affected our memories. Everything about us is fallen. Our memories are fallen too, so that we have no trouble remembering much of the trash in our past, but we do have difficulty recalling God's past blessings. And because God knows how easy it is for us to forget his blessings, he often reminds us repeatedly in the scriptures about how good he has been to us. This is why we read, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy, that as the children of Israel are on the verge of entering into the promised land, the land of Canaan, the Lord gave them about 14 warnings not to forget him and his many blessings, which he has bestowed upon them. And he did this because... God knows the tendency of the human heart is that we enjoy his blessings while at the same time forgetting the one who has blessed us. So for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting at verse 10, God tells the people, when you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good lamb which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery." 
Now, David was well aware of the weakness of his own heart in forgetting how God had blessed him. And so after telling himself to forget none of God's blessings and benefits, he lists several of those benefits as a way of reminding himself how good God has actually been to him. And what we want to do in the time remaining this morning is we want to look at those benefits that David mentions because, folks, in many cases, these are the very same blessings that God has bestowed upon each and every true believer in Christ. And when there is a benefit that David experienced personally that some of us have not, there's always a valid, timeless, biblical principle of this blessing that applies to us. So if you're a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, then these benefits are listed for you for the purpose of moving you to praise and thank God for them or the principles that they speak of. Now, the first of these benefits is that David praises God for is the forgiveness of his sins. The beginning of verse 3 says, who pardons all your iniquities. Now, it's not by coincidence that David mentions the forgiveness of his sins as the first of all of God's great benefits to him. And he does this because there is nothing more important in the life of a believer than the forgiveness of his sins. Never take that for granted. Because without God's forgiveness, you're lost. You're destined for eternal punishment. This is where it all begins. Without this, nothing else matters. But David, David being a believer, because his faith was in the Lord for his salvation, he blesses God for forgiving his sins. And God does this for all true believers. His forgiveness is unconditional based on our faith in Christ. The New Testament makes it abundantly clear that at the moment of your salvation, at the very moment, God wiped the slate clean by forgiving you, not only of your past sins, but of the sins that you might be presently engaged in, as well as any future sins you're going to commit. Very clearly do we read in Colossians 2.13, when you were dead, in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, meaning you were unsaved when you were in that condition, dead in sins, he made you alive together with him. That is to say, he regenerated you so that you put your faith in Christ, having forgiven us all our transgressions, all of them. That's why there's no condemnation for anyone in Christ Jesus, all forgiven. Now, David understood what a foul sinner he was. All you have to do is read Psalm 51 to see this because it's recorded there, his repentant cry, his confession of his sin of adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah the Hittite. And you'll see that David knew how sinfully wretched he was, how wicked he was as he repents of his wickedness. But in Psalm 32, he speaks of the forgiveness of his sin. He says in verses one, in verse one and the first part of verse two, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Impute means to credit, to put on your account iniquity. Now due to our more complete knowledge these days, thousands of years later, due to our understanding of the meaning of of the cross, the death of Christ, we understand that the Lord does not impute iniquity to our record because Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. And at that time, the Father imputed our sin to Christ. He credited to Christ our sin when Jesus was innocent. And the moment we place our trust in Christ as our Savior and Lord, he imputes, he credits Christ's righteousness of perfect obedience to the law of God, he credits that to our account. So I ask you, apart from the time when you come to church to observe the Lord's Supper, which we do once a month, do you ever just thank the Lord for forgiving all of your sins? Or do you wait for the Lord's Supper, for communion? Do you ever offer him words of appreciation and praise for imputing your sin to Christ and imputing his righteousness to you. That's what we ought to be doing on a daily basis. That ought to be 
something that all of us do. You see, there is no greater blessing than the forgiveness of our sin. For that, the Lord should rightly be praised continuously, not, not once a month. To make sure you do this, you need to do as David did. And that's the point. Tell your soul. Tell your soul to praise and thank God for forgiving you. Constantly reminding yourself to do this. Speak to your soul. And remember to thank him for forgiving all of your sins because of Christ's work on the cross. But in addition to the benefit of the forgiveness of our sins, there's a second benefit that God gave David for which he tells his soul to praise God. And that is the blessing of healing his diseases. The second part of verse 3. Who heals all your diseases. Now, this statement has puzzled and even troubled some people. We had a man many years ago in our church who came to me very troubled over this statement because he, as well as others, have interpreted this to mean that God has promised to heal every one of our diseases. And that troubled this man, as well as others, because they very well know that God doesn't heal every Christian of their diseases. And they're right. Because if that were the case, if God always healed us, then no Christian would ever die from a disease. No one ever, we would never die from cancer or from some other disease. But not only does our experience tell us that God doesn't always heal us, but more importantly, Scripture itself bears witness that believers do get sick and God doesn't always heal them. For example, we read in 2 Timothy 4.20, Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Now Paul says here that he left one of his missionary colleagues, a man by the name of Trophimus, ill in a place called Miletus, which tells us that God did not heal this man. And he didn't use the apostle Paul to heal him either. Paul left Trophimus there sick. So if God doesn't always bring us healing, then why does David say in this verse, who heals all your diseases. Remember the context. David is telling his soul to bless the Lord for those benefits that, note this, he, David, personally experienced. He's telling his soul not to forget any of God's blessings in his own life. And one of those blessings is that God had healed David of every sickness and every disease that he had him endure. You see, David isn't giving us a statement on divine healing for all of God's children. Not doing that at all. But rather, he's giving us a personal testimony of how God has worked in his own life. And in his life, up to this point, in David's life, God had healed him of every illness that he ever experienced. That's what David is saying. So the question is then, well, how do we apply this truth to our lives? Well, we certainly should be thankful to the Lord for our health because if you are relatively healthy and you've gotten over an illness, any illness, it's only because God has healed you. Now, he may have used physicians. He may have used some medicine to bring about your healing, but you should always recognize that ultimately it is God who has healed you. And therefore your praise should be reserved for him and not your health provider and not a drug. Listen to what the Lord says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, powerful words. He said, see now that I, I am he, and there is no God beside me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. So God is the source of all of our healings and all of our health. But what if God hasn't healed you of your diseases, and you find yourself ill, you find yourself physically sick, with something that perhaps eventually is going to take your life? Then what? Well, if that's the case, then you can and you should still give God thanks for this because this is precisely what Scripture says that you are to do. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything, Paul said, in everything, 
give thanks. He didn't say for everything, but in everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God makes it very clear that it is his will that we give him thanks for everything in the sense of in every circumstance. And that would include illnesses and disabilities. <coughs> Excuse me. And the reason that these are benefits to praise and thank God for isn't because these illnesses and these diseases are good things in and of themselves. They're not good things in and of themselves. But rather because God uses our illnesses, our diseases, our sicknesses, our ill health to make us more like Jesus Christ. In that we become more dependent upon him. And we're stricken with some health problem. We, we are more dependent on him. We're more humble. We've been humbled by our body breaking down. We're more sensitive to others. We're more compassionate to others. We empathize in the sufferings of others. So the question is, will you thank God for your good health or your lack of good health? This giving of thanks is, he tells you, it's his will for you. And that's what pleases him. Third benefit that David tells his soul to remember so that he gives thanks and praise to God is the blessing of being delivered from the pit of death. Verse 4, the beginning says, who redeems your life from the pit? What does David mean by the pit? Well, having told, us his, having told his soul to thank God for healing him from all of his illnesses, David now tells his soul to thank God for delivering him from death. You see, the word pit is a reference to the grave. It's just a a special word he uses, a poetic word to refer to the grave. So what David is praising God for is rescuing him from the brink of death, from dying. And David had a lot to be thankful for because so often we read through the Psalms about David and being on the battlefield and almost dying, almost being murdered by an enemy, but God delivered him. He delivered him from all his enemies who were out to kill him. And why did God do this for David? And he did it very often. Well, notice the rest of verse 4. Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. What David is saying is that the reason that God has kept him alive and has delivered him so many times from death is because of his love and compassion, his mercy in his life. And folks, that's so true of you too. You may not have been dramatically rescued from dying on a battlefield, but you can still praise God for rescuing you from dangerous situations where you didn't think you would make it, when your survival really was in doubt. And there are certainly dangerous situations that you were not even aware of when God delivered you, unbeknownst to you, he delivered you. And he did this, why? simply because of his mercy and compassion in your life. So if you are alive today, and you are, if you are hearing these words, then understand that you are alive only because God has ordained that you are alive. And he is the one sustaining you so that you continue to be alive. All he has to do is withdraw his life-sustaining hand from you for just one second and you would die. Therefore, like David, you need to tell yourself to praise him for his compassion in letting you take another breath today. Now the last benefit that David tells his soul to remember so that he gives God praise is the blessing of renewed strength. Verse five says, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Now, what David is talking about here is that God has physically renewed him. He has physically sustained him so that even as he has grown older, he still has strength and vitality. In other words, he feels strong. He feels like a, a soaring eagle. So he's praising the Lord for renewing his strength because he still has some of the same energy he had when he was a young man. Now, remember, this is David's personal testimony of how God had blessed him and he's praising the Lord not his exercise program or his healthy eating habits he's praising the Lord for giving him the physical strength he has 
But David's experience may not be your experience. The Lord may not have blessed you with youthful energy as you've aged. However, regardless of your physical prowess or lack thereof, every Christian can be thankful, thankful to the Lord for spiritual strength and vitality because Paul said these words, this promise in 2 Corinthians 4.16, which are true are of all of us if you know Christ. Therefore, he said, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. In other words, while our physical body continues to grow old and decay, our soul, our inner self, continues to grow every day in Christ-likeness, in Christ-like character. And because that's true of every believer in Christ, all of us should be thanking the Lord for the blessing of being renewed each day because regardless of how old you are and how much you have decayed physically, inwardly, you're still growing, you're still maturing spiritually, you're still able to bear godly fruit for the Lord's honor and glory. Now, folks, these are just some of the benefits for which David praised God. There were more, but these are some. Question is, what, what about you? Are you going to hear this and be obedient to God by doing what David did? Talking to yourself, reminding yourself, getting tough on yourself to thank God for all of his blessings in your life. If you don't do that, you're not going to be praising him, except when you're, you're on a high note. Are you going to worship him with all of your heart, all of your mind, thinking about the words that you see on the screen, singing to him, pay attention to what you're actually praising him for, giving him your undivided focus and attention as you give him thanks. This is what David wants us to learn so that we bless the Lord and forget none of his benefits in our own lives. And I think a good place to start, to start doing this would be tonight. How convenient that it works in our sermon. Because our evening service is a gathering as a church family for prayer and praise. It has concerned me for years of how few people from the many hundreds who say Lakeside is their church home, how few come out on a Sunday night to pray and praise. Because I, I really believe that that's, that's the um, true uh, barometer, the true temperature of our church spiritually. How we praise and pray, and, and pray to God, how much that means to us. So I encourage you, come out tonight. There's nothing that important on TV that you can't be here tonight to praise God. And remember, at the head of this list of benefits that David gives, he praised God, he praised him for the blessings of forgiveness of his sins because there's nothing more important than that. So are you forgiven of your sins? If you are, then, then you praise God for that. But if not, if you've never been forgiven of your sins, if you've never personally trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, then this is the time to do that. Not tomorrow. You don't know if you have tomorrow left. You don't know if today is going to be the day that you breathe your last breath. The scripture says, now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Don't harden your heart if God is talking to you. So I invite you, if you want to speak to one of our leaders, one of our pastors about this, I'll ask some of these men to stay after, just come up to the front. And um, if you want to speak to one of them, about your soul, your need for salvation in Christ, then just see me and I'll direct you to them. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we indeed can relate to David. We wish that we couldn't, Lord. We wish that, uh, that praise was easy for us, but it's not. But we thank you for the humanity of this king, his transparency, He's just like us, we're just like him, frail. And we get down, and we think about our problems, and we think about our troubles, and we think about our losses, and we fail to praise you, even, in the, even as we're going through the valley of the shadow of death. But Lord, help us to do what David did. Help us to rouse ourselves by, by talking to ourselves, by, by getting hard upon ourselves that we need 
to praise you regardless of how we, we feel. Uh, may the study this morning impact us, not simply for a few hours or a day, but for our lives, that we would praise you and we would know how to praise you regardless of how we feel. And we pray that tonight will be a very special time as our church family gathers to pray and to praise you. Lord, we do pray for any here without faith in you, without faith in you for salvation. We pray that you'll draw them to yourself, that they indeed may come to, to know you today and experience the marvel of the forgiveness of their sins. All of this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.